Two, the podcast to be named later here on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. His name is Jared Krugar. My name is Alex Stump. Jared, how's it going? Postseason baseball. I know the Pirates aren't involved, but, you know, throughout the first week, uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch, and it's been uh, super exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's straight steel. Randy Arose Arena. I mean. <laughs> the man in the Arose Arena. That, that was. Like that, I'm not getting the reference here. The man in the arena, Theodore Roosevelt's quote. Ah, uh, there we go. Come on, know your history, Stumpf. You're killing me. I yeah, I, wow. But I like I, Teddy I, Roosevelt. That was that was well done. I, listen, I can pull stuff out of wherever. Do you want to just, you just make this a Teddy Roosevelt podcast, or no? Should we so continue I, on with the pirates. So before we get to that, and um, before we get to more Roosevelt, we'll talk Roosevelt. Uh, I obviously grew up in Altoona, and there were two. Junior high schools or middle schools, uh, seventh or ninth grade. I went to Keith. The other one was Roosevelt, named after uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And of course, they were the Rough Riders and they were our rivals. Um, so there's that fun fact. But, um, but let's talk Pirates. Said, no, no, no. This seems like a mystery. We'll get to the Pirates eventually. <laughs> Sorry to everyone listening, do, but this we is We do just have funny. an entire offseason. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like that's a missed opportunity, though. That you should have had one Roosevelt for Teddy, and then the rival should have been for the FDR Roosevelt. Uh, no, we were we were the David Scott Keith Rams, and they were the uh, the Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt um, Rough Riders, and they were our rivals. And I actually have a, a, a stuffed ram, not an actual ram, but like a stuffed animal of a, of a, of our mascot on my on my work desk here. Um, no Roosevelt stuff um, because obviously. That would be like, you know, being a Yankees fan and having something Red Sox displayed at your house. There's a rivalry quite like that. Yet you're able to drop a Teddy Roosevelt pun every once in a while for Randy Rosarena. Oh, man. I Listen, it, it fit perfectly and got zero likes on Twitter, and I hate myself <laughs> for it. But if you, if you were under a rock over the last few days, on Thursday night, uh, Randy Rosarena pulled off a feat that nobody had ever done before in Major League Baseball in the postseason. He hit a home run, which was an absolute jack, and then he stole home. And, you know, before we started recording, Alex and I were kind of um, doing the play-by-play of the of the steal, and the jump that he got was absolutely incredible. And he was safe by at least two steps. Even Jerry Meals couldn't have screwed that up. Yeah, I mean – Part of it was who was pitching for the Red Sox at the time. I, I can't remember, but he steps off the rubber to, to throw home. So it's a, it's not a, you know, pitch, it's a pickoff attempt, which, okay, the batter can't defend, you know, against the pitch or anything, but that takes so much time. You threw him off balance. That's just what it is. If I'm, what it is. if I'm not mistaken, it had 77 miles per hour as far as the velo on the throw to the plate. Uh, or that could have been as fast as a Rosarina was running. You just never know. He, he, he was booking it. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, and that's what I think what makes the race fun though, too, is that there's, they're, they're, they're a, a, a scrappy bunch. They're fast. They, they, I mean, they have a lot of guys that you really don't know anything about. You don't know much about, but damn, they're good. Yeah, they are. And actually let's just make this whole first segment about the playoffs up to right now because it has been very interesting it's been a i mean this major league baseball they're bringing the goods so far and the rays in particular i I had a conversation dming about this like how many players on this Rays team this is a team that number one seed in the american league for the second year in a row last three years playoffs each year no team in the american league has a better winning percentage than the tampa bay Rays. How many of these players are going to even sniff, potentially sniff the Hall of Fame? Ooh, I like uh, Shane Boz. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Besides that. No, but but seriously, like there's Nelson Cruz, who I don't think will get in, but he'll get no, some right. votes. He'll he'll be on there. But he's also not really been away for that long. He was acquired, you know, in July. He hasn't been part of this run just to talk about some of the people who aren't there anymore, Blake Snell won't be. 
you know, in, in that disappointed mix. Kevin Cash can't take him out of the game when he doesn't need to this year. Tommy Pham won't be like legitimately the guy I think who has the best chance is the guy who's been in the major leagues for like three months in, in Wander Franco. And that's just because those 80 grade prospects, you don't get 80 grades. Like that's like Bryce Harper, Mike Trout t- territory up there. Yeah. And, and I mean, it goes back to this good teams, you know, I think overcome whether they have their, the no name rays. You know, they uh, let's not forget about Jordan Luplo, former uh, pirate. Good baseball player. Yes, uh, I completely, completely agree. I remember having multiple discussions with Michael Ryan um, when he was the manager of the Hudson Curve about Luplo and, and Luplo's hands um, in particular. And he's a guy that was kind of flying under the radar and he has continued to fly under the radar. Yeah. And you know what? I'm, I just pulled up the race stats here real fast their number one player this year going by war was brandon lau at at 4.8 war like this is a team that doesn't have superstars like uh, uh, brian reynolds had six this past year but Mm -hmm. you know then you've got austin meadows at 11th with two war which is you know above average baseball player average ish a little above in, in that regard and it's just a very deep team. It is a team of, of Kevin Kiermeyers and Joey Wendells. And, you know, they, they look good. They, I know they don't have a lot of starting pitching, but they know how to use that bullpen. That bullpen is more valuable in the postseason, I believe. A good enough hitting core. You know, my, the team I thought was going to win <laughs> The World Series going into this postseason, the White Sox, they got off off to a pretty shaky start. So I I, I made my bet. I'll, I'll, I'll sleep in it. But if they get bounced, I think the Rays are going to be my second choice. Uh, the Rays are my first choice out of the AL. And I think the Giants are my uh, – it's not a thing. I think the Giants are my top choice out of the NL to get to the World Series. And I think the Rays do actually pull it off. I like I like what Kevin Cash has done with the bullpen. Um, they're really good. <laughs> And I like, you know, watching this team uh, on Thursday, that was, they were a lot of fun to watch. And again, I think they are more of a complete team. And I think that's what makes them so intriguing because they, they can beat you in a multitude of different ways. They got power from Cruz, the Rosarina, they've got speed as well. And they've got the pitching too. And they're doing it with young pitching. I don't think any of the starters in the first three games um, for the Rays are over the age of 25. Yeah, I mean, it is a young rotation. There is no Charlie Morton anymore, mm. even though that would probably help them at this moment. <laughs> um, no, he's in the postseason with the Braves, right? With the Barbs, that's right. Uh, wild card games, I, I have absolutely nothing to say about Yankees Red Sox. That was just a that was just a generic whatever baseball game. And whenever you compare it to Cardinals Dodgers. You know, being just a pitching treat, that that was that was a fun baseball game to watch. Yeah, I mean, Wayne Wainwright shoved. Um, Scherzer, I thought, did really well too. Um, even though the result didn't really end up, I mean, he still threw really well. I, I didn't think he should have come out at, at, in that um, in that part of the game. Uh, same thing with Wainwright. I mean, I, if you're gonna have that sort of a leash on Wainwright uh, during that game, I mean, why did you hit for him, or why didn't you hit for him? Yeah, but, you, but you that, threw away an out. Yeah, but that was a great game, um, in my opinion, and that was exactly what makes the wild card game so much fun. You're on your you're on your the edge of your seat for three hours, three and a half hours, but for all nine innings because every pitch matters, every at bat matters, every play in the field matters, and that's what you know. That's that's the special thing about you know the wild card game, I and mean, that's what makes it cool. Um, as I go back and forth all the time because one game series aren't really isn't baseball, right? But so what? It, it's one game. It's it's a winner take all. I think that's what makes it. Um, that's what makes it special and unique. Um, and hey, guess what? If you don't like it, <laughs> be better. Yeah. What? Where do you fall on uh, touching back to to Scherzer and, 
and, and Wainwright real fast. And we just talked about the Rays. I mean, that legitimately might be two Hall of Famers, you know, going off in a one game playoff right there. But where do you fall on the trusting your guy versus, you know, bullpenning? in those situations because both of those teams had really good bullpens and I, I know Chris Taylor hit the walk off Homer, but it's hard to fault, you know, what say Lewis's bullpen did that day. They, they backed up their starter pretty well right up until that last pitch. I, I don't know. I, I was with you that I was not to say Max Scherzer's is a future hall of famer. He should get opportunities like that, but I, I, I don't know. I, I felt like, He's he's got a chance at a Cy Young this year. Maybe you let him push a little more. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, I think I think with if, if there's anybody that I would let go deeper, I think it's definitely Scherzer. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it's winner take all. It's if you don't win that game, you're done. Your season's over. So I mean, you have to put your team in the best position to succeed. Typically, if that's a, I think if that's game one of a three game series, you let them go. Oh, absolutely. But, the, but but the stakes were so high in that in that instance. I think that's what makes it so and that's what makes it special and unique too. You know, should he have stayed in the game? Could he have stayed in the game? Probably even Wainwright could have too. But then they get to the to the quality bullpens, the quality arms back there, and and the arms get it done. And you know, that's and sometimes it doesn't work out that way, right? You know, it could have very easily they take Scherzer out and the bullpen implodes and, and, and bad things happen. Or in Wainwright's instance, they bring in the bullpen for St. Louis and they let those runners score. And it's a completely different ball game. You know, it wasn't like the Red Sox game where they just beat Garrett Cole to a pulp. Uh, and then in a weird twist, Garrett Cole was followed by Clay Holmes in a postseason baseball game. Yeah, I, I was I was first of all, I forgot I had something to actually say about that Yankees. Red Sox game. Kyle Schwarber is just the boogeyman for Garrett Cole. Third in inning season. in the wild card game. I and, I and honestly, I'm watching that game because the Yankees were my team growing up. And I know you hate this, but Derek Jeter was my boy, right? And, you know, so I was a Yankees fan growing up. So I'm watching this game and I'm like, where have I seen Kyle Schwarber do that to Garrett Cole before? I was like, oh, 2015. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Very was... Same situation. <laughs> Yeah, that was I. So that was it, one of those like instantaneous. Everybody on Twitter had like a group think of he, he did it again. He did it again. Right, and and so the, and what's funny about those two games, if you compare them, right? If you compare the Red Sox and the Yankees to the Cardinals and the uh, Dodgers, obviously Dodgers Red Sox move on. Great, good for them. And it, what's funny is that they both play the winners of their divisions. The Dodgers play the Giants for the first time ever in the postseason. The Red Sox obviously are playing the Rays. But, like, what's funny to me is that, like, the, the Cardinals, nobody's talking about what the Cardinals are going to do in the offseason. They, they're, they're fine. But, like, this entire situation for the Yankees opened up an entirely big can of worms because it's another postseason game, especially a wild card game, where Garrett Cole struggled mightily, which isn't out of the ordinary by any means. Um, but it's just one of those situations where, I mean, is Aaron Boone, Aaron bleeping Boone back? Um, who knows? Yeah. Who knows there? And, you know, I, to close this first one, I hate the, the, the Dodgers and Giants have never met in the postseason before. Yes. It wasn't considered a formal like division series or championship series or anything like that. But, but what about, Bobby Thompson. Oh, okay. What, what, That's what, true. What, what Shot her around a, the world. Yeah. yeah. What happened about okay. 1962? I, Twitter taught me about that one, but it's – come on. There's baseball history there. I, I, it's fine. I'll take the – you're technically right, but I, I, I refuse The San Francisco to. Giants and the Los Angeles Dodgers have not played. 1962. I, I learned that the hard way after I put on that they never – that they hadn't met in the postseason since Bobby Thompson. But, but no, and I think that's what, I mean, it's it set. It, this is the most exciting time of the year other than opening day. Right. So I'm very excited to see what the rest of the playoffs have in store, because I think every game should be entertaining. I think um, they're all pretty evenly matched. 
uh, throughout um, both the AL and the NL. So it'll be interesting to see who comes out on top. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Pirates Podcast. To be named later on the TK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. That's $20 uh, from Alex and I. If you can say that without spitting your drink up or choking on your words. Um, but Alex. Who's $20? Yours. You make more than I do. Oh. Um, or at least I imagine you would make more. You're tenured on the Pirates beat, and I'm just the new guy. Um, I'm just the minor. You're guy. longer than me. I've been with the site longer. Yeah, it's crazy uh, because you keep following me everywhere I go. That's um, right. But September is, um, you know, outside of the Green Green Day song, Wake Me Up When September Ends. Um, we're finally into October. But a couple of guys for the Pirates had some really good months of, uh, of September that really propelled them and, and made a case for them for the next uh, for the next year and even beyond, in my opinion. Yeah, we're going to just run through a couple of those guys here pitcher and hitter for each my hitter i'm batting lead off here alex wait 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 wait, wait. you're hitting from the leadoff spot what's your ops uh my ops at a leadoff spot is 853 oh please is, don't tell me that's anthony alford's ops in the month of september it was oh. that was look i get people who were if people are still skeptical Skeptical. I can't talk anymore. Skeptical of Anthony Alford. There are definitely still more strikeouts than you would like to see out of a player with that, you know, hitting profile, defensive profile. I, I can't even argue that Tucker Barnhart just absolutely demolished him on the base paths in the month of September. Too many caught stealings there. I, I don't know what that scouting report was, but it, it probably should be updated. But he had a really good month. And we were basing, you know, he kind of went into spring training this last year after a couple good games. No, this was a real month. This was a real month whenever he got on base. He showed some power. He showed his ability in the field. He showed a willingness to run on the base pass, well, maybe to his own detriment, but showing that that can be part of his game. He's a fast player. Once he's able to get that first step taken care of, I think he could steal a decent amount of bases. Look, the way I look at this outfield spot right now, or just outfield position, there's Brian Reynolds in center field, and who knows really who's going to be flanking him. At some point, Travis Swaggerty will be called up. Maybe O'Neill Cruz does eventually go to a corner outfield spot, but I, I don't see really anything guaranteed. I think an Alfred Gamble, you know, corner outfield is not saying that's going to be, you know, a big, sexy outfield right there. But I think that's probably the most likely at this given time. Maybe there's a trade or a sign that comes along that changes that. I don't know. I think Alfred benefited from consistent playing time, consistently playing left field more consistent at bats down the stretch, still a whole lot to, you know, polish up, iron out, but you know, this is still the lottery ticket player. If he can become, he can be an impact player still. No, right. And I agree. I mean, the biggest thing for him, I think is it's, he is very much feast or famine. It's either great or oh, it's yeah. not at all great. And you know, that's, I think the consistency in the at-bats, I think it's huge. Consistency in playing time is, is always going to benefit you. I mean, you, it's very hard to be a bench player at any level in any sport, especially baseball, because you're coming into games cold and, and it's just not a great situation to be a part of. But when you're playing every day and you're getting those everyday reps, it's, it's a heck of a lot different than, than, you know, what you would typically expect. Um, so I think that's good. And, and he, he made the most of it. And I think that's all you can ask. And yeah, the outfield is wide open outside of center field. That's obviously Brian Reynolds spot and Brian Reynolds spot for years to come, whether that means Cruz is there or they kind of just, you know, you make the right fielder utility guy and use a couple different people uh, or whether they give, you know, all for the left field spot. I mean, it, it's, it's still wide open. And I think he did a really good job of finishing the year on a high note 
um, and going into the off season uh, with some confidence, because I think that's going to really just feed into, into spring training next year. And if he can come out of camp, you know, um, with, with having a good spring training, that could be a really good thing. But for me, he's got to be more consistent at the plate. I mean, the base running, they're, t- they're trying to be aggressive. I get it. They're doing it at all levels. But the biggest thing for me, though, is the fact that, you know, you just got to cut down that, that strikeout rate. And if you're, if you're able to get on base a little bit more, then, then I'm all for it. Or all for it. Boo. Who's your hitter? Uh, mine's cool, Tucker. Uh, and, and here's why I think defensively, obviously the glove is played and that's both at shortstop second base. And, and he's honestly a, a pretty serviceable outfield as well. Outfielder as well. Uh, even though it, that just kind of, that experiment just sort of started uh, within the last few years, but his hitting is starting to come around. You know, you've mentioned some of his mechanical uh, fixes and I think it's your, again, the, the consistent playing time helps. Um, and, and Tucker is a guy that, you know, needs, you know, consistent playing time. And that's what he was getting at Indy. Uh, obviously when he comes up, it's not always quite the case. Um, but, you know, I think he did a really good job uh, in September uh, uh, of coming in and establishing himself as, you know, Hey, listen, if it, if it's down between Kevin Newman and, and Cole Tucker, who's it going to be and why? And, and in my opinion, as great as Kevin Newman is with the glove, the offense has got, still got to pick up, but he's obviously a coachable guy and, and Tucker is the same way. But you know Tucker's Tucker, and I think he's a guy that that could that could really be that that utility guy and and give you some really good everyday reps. Whether you need him at shortstop, second base, or or even in the outfield. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think I'm that. This is not a you know controversial opinion anymore. I think Tucker has a higher offensive ceiling than Kevin Newman right now. Which imagine saying that two years ago, that'd be really hard to believe given you know just where Kevin Newman was as a hitter but I I think there's a lot that Tucker zeroed in right on those final weeks of the season and you know exact same boat as Anthony Alford you don't know what's going to happen we don't know for sure what's going to happen in that middle infield right now all we can say is that there is going to be competition you know come spring training between whomever is in that mix whether it's Chavis and Newman and Tucker and Castro and Cruz and just you know a long list of guys that you could just throw over there but until that actually happens it's just speculation I I think Tucker zeroed in on some stuff was able to improve and if nothing else he showed that you know the glove might be worth keeping him in there. Not to say that Newman's not a slouch. Newman might be nominated for Gold Glove this year. If he is, he's he's deserving. You're not dropping off going to Tucker. No, and I and and like like we said, the glove has always played. It's always been that def- that offensive aspect of his game. And if he can get that turned around, he could be a very good everyday player at the major league level. And and I've thought that since I've seen him in Altoona. And obviously, you know, he makes those adjustments. And and again, it's very tough when you're not playing every day. And and but he's he's been able to to turn it around. And and he really he finished the year on a strong note. As much as Alfred did, I think Cole Tucker even one upped him just a little bit in that department with where he was at at the beginning of the season to where he was uh, game one sixty two. Here. You, I did hitter first. You do pitcher first. Oh, I get to be the starting pitcher out of the red uh, out of, um, to to start this off. And I, my my guy is Mitch Keller. Um, he is the most I think intriguing um, candidate out of the um, out of the the starting uh, starting rotation. Um, he showed some flashes of great and flashes of good, and he showed some flashes of oh no, and and you know I but the good flashes and the great flashes I thought outnumbered the oh no's and i think that's you know that's that's a sign of growth and as as weird as it is to say that from a guy that was a a top prospect you know you've got to you got to see what he's got and and he is part of the future but if he can turn it around and i think he's he's on the right track he strongly got together a couple of good starts and and you know when that happens you build that confidence and and I think you're really starting to see the Mitch Keller that 
that should have been playing or that that should be out there every every fifth day. Yeah, and I think that last outing of the season, we might look back and that was the most important one of the year for whenever they said, hey, Oscar Marine challenged him and said, hey, let's work on your delivery. I want you to be more whippy and, you know, extend a little more. And I, I wrote that in a mound visit whenever he was demoted. I wrote that, you know, he just wasn't getting as much, as much extension whenever he was throwing in his motion. And there was a drop in his velocity. There was a drop in his spin. And not saying that, you know, it all came back, but, you know, the first time th- – Throwing it like that, there was an uptick in the velocity. There was an uptick in the spin. The results were better. There's a lot riding on Mitch Keller. Oh, absolutely. That he, He's been afforded more chances. He will be afforded more chances than a lot of other players that, you know, who come in with an opportunity, but, you know, with maybe one foot out the door coming in. <laughs> but if he does figure something out and I think that extension is a part of maximizing what he can do on a major league field. If, if that happens, that would be a huge, huge boost to the rotation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the skill sets there, the the talent is there. It's just channeling that in the right way to, and, and performing going out and executing. You can be uh, the greatest player on paper that you want to be. You can be, you could have a 0.00 ERA, spin rate and and you know tens of thousands even or whatever and obviously i'm exaggerating but you, you got to go out and execute and and that's the biggest part and if you don't go out and execute then on paper it doesn't really matter you can just light it on fire and hope for the best and you know you you have to go out and execute that's that's the name of the game and if you're not able to do that then see ya Pitcher, I, I don't want to just double down on Mitch Keller, and I'll be honest, I, I couldn't really think of anyone who – there were a lot of injuries down the stretch. So, like, I would have liked to see more Bryce Wilson. I would have liked to see more Dylan Peters. I would have liked to see a lot, but I just don't have a lot. So, I'm going to go based off of the guy, and this is partially his results, and it's partially just what – I heard in what people are saying, you know, over those last couple outings, but I think Max Kranich showed a little something in those final three starts of the year. Like final three, we're not extremely small sample size. We're talking about 14 innings, which in itself isn't what you really want out of three starts, but a 386 ERA, 438 FIP, struck out 13 in those 14, only one homer. A couple times where it looked like he really shoved, he developed. This was a tough year for Max or any pitcher in that situation. It's tough being that 26th or I'm sorry, 27th guy, you know, on the roster who comes up and makes those spot starts and then gets optioned. And early on in the year, it was something that probably weighed on him a little more than he would let on. But as the year progressed, every time they sent him down to the minor leagues, this is another thing Marine said. Every time they sent him back down to the minor leagues, they're like, we want you to work on this. He came up. There was noticeable improvement there. You know, we want you to focus on your delivery. He comes back up. There's improvement with the delivery. And, you know, for a 23-year-old kid making in the major leagues, finishing off the year fairly strong, I think that's encouraging. I think he's got a shot at making the opening day rotation next year. If nothing else, I I don't see him bouncing up and down between the majors. I think once something happens, it's going to be like, okay, Max Grant, it's going to get an extended look up here. No, I I think that's a really good point. And uh, we forget that he started in Altoona this year. Yeah. So to go from double A to the majors, while of course certain people on this podcast have done it and and even Rodolfo Castro as well, you know, that's not always – um, it's not always an easy thing to do. And so the growth that he's shown there, I think it's huge. And I think that last start was super important for him, you know, again, getting into the off season and, and really getting in there with some confidence and you could see the confidence really start to build for him on the mound as he went. And, and when you go out there in your first game and you perform the way that he did, and you know, you're, you're setting these expectations that aren't really realistic. 
So you're going to come down to earth and it's, it's how good or bad is that going to be? How, you know, how dramatic is that return to earth going to be? Is it going to be a crash? Is it going to be a smooth landing? And, and I think he crashed a little bit, you know, it was a little bit rocky, but again, he's 23 years old. It's his first extended experience in, in major league baseball or in the majors. So I think he's got a lot of room for improvement. Um, but the, the fact that he goes out there and improves every start it, uh, for the most part is a really good sign. And like I said, I, I, I couldn't be like, yeah, Anthony Bonda or, oh. or Kyle Keller or just like, I just, I just watched a lot of pitching that I, I don't see having any impact on this organization long-term and a lot of pitchers who could ended up getting hurt. So it was not yeah, to take anything you, away from those last couple starts from Max. I, I say, I meant that legitimately. I think he did challenge hitters. He said a couple of times, you know, they're, big moments you know there are a couple runners aren't where he executed his pitches he got out of jams good to see <laughs> but to say pitcher of the month or why how did we preface this you know someone who really intrigued us in september yeah who and who improved their stock yeah he did but you know not drastically not like tucker offered right and it's a little different to it, right. And it's a little different, especially for the pitchers, but you know, I think he's a guy that could be in that, that back end of that rotation next year. If things go, I well. think so too. I think and, so um, too. You, listen, we are agreeing. That, uh, like what? No, no, we're not allowed to do that. We're going to, we're going to take a minute to sort this out so we can come back nice and angry for the last segment of the show. Stay tuned. Podcast to be named later on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I'm saying it slow and methodical so that I don't chew up my words and and really sound like Alex sounded at the end of that last segment. But Alex, the Pirates for the second minor league season in a row. I, I don't count 2020 um, as a, as a real year because there was no minor league. There there wasn't a minor league season, but they let go of of a top level manager. Uh, and and AAA and Brian Esposito. Yeah, and it's he was running the um, alternate site last year and this season. A bit of, of a surprising move given where he was at the start of the season, it, it looked like standing-wise, but that's the curse of minor league baseball. It's tough to always – sometimes you just need to bring in fresh blood. Sometimes there's – Maybe something else that contributes to the factor there. He didn't have a whole lot to work with in Indianapolis this year also. So I, I don't know how you could really assess him or the rest of the coaching staff with what's going on or what, what they were provided. Like Henry Hand sticking around, which if there's anyone on that coaching staff that you have to hang on to, it, it's Joel Hanrahan right now. Right. And, and with him and, and John Nunnally, I think those are, those are two guys that the Pirates think highly of and they're holdovers from the last uh, regime. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you have a situation like Esposito and, and he's a guy that was in the organization before Charrington was here, um, it's just, hey, what what have you done for me lately? And and I think at times, you know, it, it hey, somebody has to get sacrificed. And and he was that guy much like and, I don't think it's quite the same thing as Mike Ryan was a couple years ago. Um, but now I'm, what I'm interested in is to see how they move, if they move guys up, if they move managers up, because we talked about all the time this year of keeping groups of players together. Well, will they do that with coaching staffs too? Will Miguel Perez move to triple A? Will Kieran Matheson move to, to double A? I'm very interested to see how they handle that and really what the pirates do moving forward with that position. And maybe it would be one of us. I don't know. I think if Miguel Perez is going to be interviewed, you know, for, he's going to have a shot at it. I think that's the logical choice because I feel like he tapped into something with O'Neill Cruz. He tapped into something with Contreras. He helped tap into 
stuff with, you know, Kenan Smith and the Jigbo, with, with Cal Mitchell, with, with just that court. And if you have an opportunity to keep that band together, especially next year, a lot of those guys are probably going to get called up and be optioned back. I mean, how many guys just go up to the major leagues and that's that? You never go back. Having, I think, a stable voice there for a year would be beneficial. Then again, if they keep them in double A for another year and they move, say, Mattinson up, up to triple uh, A, then, you know, the Pagueros, the Gonzaleses, they could have a friendly face whenever they come up. So we'll find out exactly what they want to do. If it's an internal hire, I don't know how you can go anywhere besides – Mattinson or Perez or I'll just throw Hanrahan his name in the mix also if he if he would rather do that even though we'd never see pitching coaches become managers yeah I, it, it'll be interesting to see what they do and I, and I mean this is really you know the first time that the Charrington's had to do this um and his, I mean, Perez was kind of this right um but it, it's going to be interesting to see really what what Charrington does um and how how they handle this. And, you know, this is, for me, it's one of the more intriguing things of the off season because I don't think we'll even find out until probably spring training. So, um, but no, I'm, uh, it, it's just one of those deals. It's, Hey, that's the nature of the business. It is a business uh, at the end of it. It's, Hey, who knows what's going to happen next. And I think that's kind of, you know, where I'm at with it. And, and I'm listen working uh, and, and seeing Miguel Perez in action, um, I think he's going to be an excellent, he would be excellent for it. Uh, same thing with, with Madison. What he did in um, Greensboro was, was obviously that team was talented, but, but they were very competitive and, and very, you know, hardworking group. And I think that's the, the future is bright if they continue to get these guys to develop. And I think that's a really good situation to be in um, this off season. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast to be named later here on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe wherever you find fine podcasts. Be sure to follow along with the other great shows that we have here on this channel. For Jared Prugar, this is Alex Stump saying thank you so much for listening. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.